morning if you're on Zoom. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, it would be great to keep it open at Joshua chapter 7. And if you don't, I'll be reading out the verses anyway as we go along. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you. We come to your word, a part of the Bible which is very weighty. Soften our hearts to hear and obey your voice. Enable us to see that in the midst of sin, trouble and turmoil, you have offered us grace in the Lord Jesus. So be with us now. We pray this in his name. Amen. So this morning we come to a very confronting passage of the Bible. The sin of one man, Akan, brings God's wrath and judgment onto a whole nation. And it results in the Israelites' failed attempt to capture a small, uh, small city, Ai. And more vividly, we see God's wrath and judgment in the execution of Akan, his entire family, young, old, men, women, his livestock, his possessions, all burned up. A family line completely eliminated forever. And as we hear this story, we have a choice. We can point the finger at God and say, God, you are a petty, barbaric monster. Or we can see the reality that the penalty is so severe because the sin is so severe. And this act of severe judgment on one man's sin makes us really uncomfortable because I think we come to this passage with a small view of sin. We live in a society that downplays sin. We are desensitized to sin. And without any understanding of what sin is, we can never make sense of the punishment that we just read of in the passage. So this morning, in order to understand the severity of Achan's punishment and to hear the warning for us today in regards to our attitude and relationship to sin, I want us to see, firstly, that our sin is actually worse than we think it is. But also, our saviour is better than we think he is. And you can follow along on your sermon outlines in the um, bulletins that you have. So firstly, our sin is worse than we think. And I want us to see five observations about sin in this passage. Firstly, all sin is against God. Akan stole a beautiful designer robe, 200 shekels of silver, a gold wedge. If he was arrested today, in today's prison system, he would be classed as a low category offender because he didn't commit a violent crime. It's very similar to if someone was caught quietly stealing a row of rings in a jeweler. Didn't hurt anybody, just did it in the back. They would be sentenced to 12 months of prison, but prison farm with chicken wire around it. Good behavior bond when they come out. Not too big. Certainly not a high risk individual. He didn't plan a terror plot. He didn't do a massacre. And if we just read chapter 7 in isolation, it doesn't seem that his crime was that bad at all. Certainly not bad enough to justify the execution of him, his family, his possessions. But just listen to the instructions that God gave the people of Israel in the previous chapter. Straight after the Lord gave the victory to Israel, the direction is clear. Let me read to you chapter 6, verses 18 to 19. And it says this, But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. But, but, we start verse 1 of chapter 7 with these sobering words. But, the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. A Khan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. The key here is to see that first and foremost, sin is against God. 
by taking these items, he took what was rightfully God's because he wanted it for himself. A Khan prized, loved, all of these things instead of God. Rather than standing in awe of God, his power and his promises, he stands in awe of the created, not the creator. And you see how easy it is to rob God of his glory. And this is disobedience. This is sin. And it's sobering, isn't it? When we look below the surface of sin, our sin, we realize that all sin is against God. Just think through the sins that we struggle with. And if you unpack these sins, whatever they are, it reflects something. It reflects that we, we don't really understand or want God. We prefer other things, other persons, other ways of living. God is not our supreme treasure, and we fall short of knowing and cherishing and loving him above all things. The root of all sin is a heart that prefers things rather than God. So it's not just harmlessly stealing a few things, as Achan did, or the bad things that we do, but all sin is against God. But we need to ask the question, how does a person end up in sin? Well, secondly, because sin is deceitful. For Akan, deceit started with forgetting about God. Akan was a member of the people of God, the tribe of Judah. He saw God's power, seeing all Jericho melt in fear because of God. He walked through the waters of the Jordan that were parted. He came to see God's promises come true. He came to experience the victory of God, the presence of God. He experienced all of that, this Akan, and he pushes it aside for his own desires. And with this faith of God pushed aside, he places himself in that prime position to be deceived. Look with me at verse 21. When I saw the plunder... A beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. You see the pattern of sin there. I saw, I coveted, and I took it. And it's not just an isolated incident here. This pattern is a representative pattern of all of mankind, of you and me and our sin. If we go back to the beginning of time in Genesis, chapter 3, verse 6. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And through that, mankind plunged into sin. I saw, I coveted, I took. And we see this pattern happen again and again. From Genesis, you keep reading, and you read about King David, the great king, who saw the wife of Uriah the Hittite, coveted, took her. For Akan, God said no to taking these devoted things, but he saw it. He took it. And there's a lesson here for us as well. When God says no, when I say no, I I want my way. I'm going to take it. What happens? We experience this. Maybe it's something that you want materially. Maybe it's a relationship that you want. Maybe it's good things, like ministry. You have a good heart for something in the future that you believe God wants you to do, but maybe God is saying no. And in the midst of these pressures and these desires, and God says, not now, do we put our faith in God and his timing? Do we place our faith in ourselves? Will we be deceived by sin in those moments of temptation? Hear the words of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So rather than submitting to that sinful pattern of I see, I covet, I take, We can submit to the will of God instead. And just look at how deceitful sin was to Akan. He somehow was led to believe that he could hide his sin. He took the devoted things and he hid them in the ground of his tent. 
how deceived can you be to think that God, who can part seas, who can know the future, who knows the future, who is the future, who can give victory, who can crush enemies, God, that God, somehow he can't see things that you hid in a tent. And the lesson here is really simple. You can't hide sin from God. And whatever you're hiding from God this morning, remember, it's not actually hidden from him. Don't be deceived by sin. And the third element of sin that we see in this passage is that it impacts others. And you realize that the entire chapter 7 account is tied to the sin of one man. Yes, Joshua wasn't prayerful in his approach to take AI. Yes, he wasn't he wasn't, you know, complacent actually with the number of troops that he sent. But the defeat of Joshua and his men by the small army of Ai is, is not actually a result of Joshua's complacency, but because of the, God, uh, the wrath of God on them. Look with me at the end of verse 1, and it says, So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. All of this because of the sin of one man. And throughout chapter 7, we see that there is a connection between the responsibility of the individual for their own sins, but there's also something contagious about sin, how it impacts those around us. See, in verse 1, we we see that the Israelites acted unfaithfully. It says Israelites. In the same sentence, it singles out a Khan. And then it says God's anger burned against Israel. But then in verse 14 and 19, it singles out a Khan. And he confesses that he has sinned. And, and it's a really pointy reminder for us. And it might be shocking for us to hear that none of us here is truly an individual in isolation from everyone else. It's the concept of corporate solidarity. Simply put, it's the relationship between one and the many. And it's actually not a concept that's too foreign to us. You see, we experience this when we see a swimmer win gold for Australia. And what do we say? We won gold. Did you wake up every morning at 5 a.m. since the age of seven to train? We won gold. We experience this when we pay higher premiums for our insurance. Even though you have a clean driving record, it's because of the place you live and all the people around you who sin in their cars all day make your premiums higher. And we experience this corporate solidarity when we hear the warnings of Scripture that remind us that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. We are reminded of this corporate solidarity when we read in Scriptures that we are called the body of Christ and we are parts and we impact each other. So let's not think that our actions, our sin, affects us alone because our individual choices bring consequence to those we love and possibly those we don't even know because our sin affects others. On the flip side, don't forget the the positive side to this corporate solidarity. One man, Abraham, believed God and his promises. The whole world is blessed. One man, the Lord Jesus Christ, dies on the cross. Many are made righteous. We now come to the fourth element of sin. And I think that this is the most shocking, weighty element, and it's this. Sin separates us from God. And there are chilling, chilling words right in the middle of verse 12. Have a look at that. Chilling words. I will not be with you anymore. Unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. As long as Akan's sin is still lingering and not dealt with, the presence of God will not be there. But rather the wrath of God is upon them. See, in previous chapters, in chapter 2, we, we saw, we can see what life looks like for those who live under the wrath of God. The people of Jericho melted in fear because God was with the Israelites. But there is a reversal in chapter 7. 
because of one man's sin, the wrath of God was against the entire Israelite community. And they have become enemies of God. Just have a look at verse 5. It says, They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Can't get worse than this for the Israelites because nothing is more crucial than the presence of God to them. Their entire existence relies on God's presence. Without God, they are dead. Without hope, objects of God's holy wrath. So, so far we've looked at how all sin is against God. All sin deceives and sin impacts others. And most shockingly, sin separates us from God. Just think about that. All sin separates us from God. That means from the smallest lie to the mass murder. From the rejection of God by small ignorances to the staunch atheist that says and declares publicly and daily that God is dead, all sin, whatever it is, puts us into the category of being under God's wrath. And it's a hopeless situation as long as sin remains. Hopeless. And we see the reaction of Joshua in verses 6 to 9 where he realizes that God is not with them. And this drives him to utter despair. Rightly so. Despair. But look at God's response to Joshua's despair in verses 10 to 11. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Sounds abrupt, doesn't it? But for God to say, stop praying, get up. In God's wrath, though, he, he remembers mercy. God, he doesn't allow Joshua and Israel to just grope around in the dark. But he reveals to them the cause of this wrath. And he gives them the solution. Listen to verse 12 again. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. And here we come to the fifth point about sin, is that all sin must be dealt with. See, the solution here is to destroy, eliminate sin. And this is what Joshua carries out in totality. He follows the command of God to gather the Israelites and by a set process get to the one source of sin, which is Akan. And I want us to see that throughout that whole process, I think it was pretty long, um, Akan was still so deceived by sin. Lots of opportunity to confess, but he remained silent all the way until the end when Joshua said, come on, it's you. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. Only then does Akan confess. And the warning here for us is, as we look at this, is that God will deal with all of our sins. We can't keep tight-lipped thinking that we can hide it. At the end of the day, God knows and will judge it. No tent can hide your sin. And because all sin, including Akan's sin, is serious, it demands full judgment and elimination. Because a holy God can only dwell with the holy people. And this is what we see Joshua carry out on behalf of God the heavy verses 24 to 25 read. Then Joshua with all Israel took a Khan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. At this point, you might be asking that question. Why does Akan's family need to be executed with him? One explanation might be his whole family were maybe accessories to the guilt. They must have known that he was hiding this stuff in the tent. But the passage doesn't actually mention any of this. He doesn't explain why his livestock were also wiped out because he, surely the ox wasn't part of the the, the crime. 
Secondly, maybe another explanation is that a Khan is the head of the household, responsible for his house. So he will, his responsibility and his guilt will be extended to the house that he led. So therefore they must all be eliminated because he's the head. But rather than speculate, why? It's important to accept that from the passage that we are given here today, we are not told. We are not told. This passage has been written in a certain way, with details, without details, for a reason, a very good reason. And I think that the reason is to drive us to embrace what we actually know. Don't speculate. Embrace what we know. And it's this. Firstly, the shock and horror that we feel when we read this passage about judgment on sin, it's a real feeling that you're feeling as you read this. It's uncomfortable. And this should awaken us from any weak view of sin that we may have. Secondly, remember that this punishment was given out by a righteous, just, good, holy God and that the penalty is severe because the sin is severe. There can't be any injustice on God's part. But thirdly, we can find comfort in many, many, many passages in the Old Testament and New Testament, such as Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 26, reminding us that individuals should suffer for their own sins, not the sins of others. And I'll read that to you, Deuteronomy 24, 26. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. So we find comfort in that. But finally, we must realize that this account of Akan and his family and this execution happened in a unique time in history where the Israelites were commanded to destroy the entire city of Jericho in order to cut off any pagan influences. Akan's action places him and his family under the same judgment of Jericho because the evils of Jericho were brought into his house. It's a bit like this, if there was such thing as Google Maps back in that day. Joshua, after chapter 6, where they took over Jericho, he would go back and he would open his phone and he would type in Jericho and it's destroyed so he'd expect it to say not found, doesn't exist but as he types it in, what comes up? He says one place found what? Jericho and it comes up with a Khan's address we expected that Jericho was completely destroyed 100% but the reality was that a Khan took a little bit of it. It was still there. 0.1% was still there and it's in Akan's house. And since God's people are to be his holy people living in his holy place under his complete holy rule, even then a little hint of sin has to be eliminated. But it's also amazing to see that this happens in the opposite. When Joshua chapter 2, Rahab, non-Israelite, Canaanite prostitute, through faith in God's word, hid the spies, gathered her whole family into her house, and was spared from destruction. Imagine Rahab, if there was a mobile phone and Google back then, sitting in her house with her phone as the Israelites marched around, marched and marched. And what did she do? She just searched Google Maps Israel. Oh, huh? what? My house? Her address would come up. Because through God's word, her faith, God's saving plan, she became part of Israel and spared from destruction. So the shock and horror we feel of seeing one man's sin led to an entire family wiped out should wake us up to see that our sin, sin is much worse than we think. And look with me at the result of this severe judgment on sin. The final verse, verse 26. Over a Khan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Accor ever since. The Lord turned from his fierce anger. Once sin is dealt with completely, the Lord turns away his anger and his wrath 
and it's no longer on the people of Israel. A Khan's execution is the resolution of the chapter, but this resolution is actually the beginning of our problem. What's the problem? The problem is this. How can we remain in fellowship with a God who is so severe towards sin? Because if Akan is punished for his sin, then surely you and I fall under that same penalty. And the answer to this isn't in defining or redefining who God is. God is the same. He's just as severe about sin back then as he is today. He's holy. The problem isn't that God has changed. God hasn't changed. But the answer to this is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, if you are moved, shaken by the death of a Khan and the stoning because of his sin, just think about what our sin did to Jesus as he, being the sinless son of God, died for us so that we don't have to suffer as a Khan did. The punishment meant for us was born by Jesus on the cross. This is amazing grace, freely given to those who turn to him and trust him. And only when we come to terms with how serious sin is can we understand exactly how much Christ has done for us. Because you know what? Our Savior is much, much better than we think. See, the problem that we face daily, hourly, every minute actually, is that we we can have a very shallow view of sin. A shallow view of sin breeds a shallow view of your need to be saved, which results in a shallow view of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you see the connection between the three? Our sin, our need, and our Savior. It impacts each other based on our attitudes to that. And there's so many out there who promote a really shallow Jesus, a Jesus who is just a teacher to inspire us to live better lives, A teacher, or a Jesus who is a prophet in the line of many other prophets who are equal to him. Or a Jesus who is just one of the many paths to fulfillment and peace. And if you put your faith into one of those Jesuses, then be warned that the wrath of God is not dealt with, still remains on you as it did on Akan. Or if you see no need for a saviour, then the wrath of God still remains on you as it did on Akan. Our sin is worse than we think, but we have a saviour who can meet that real need that we have for salvation from God's wrath. So this morning, as we look at this account, firstly, let's, let's deepen our view of sin. Ask yourself, what's your relationship to sin today? How serious is it to you? Is there sin in your life that is just numb? doesn't feel weighty anymore. And by reflecting on this story of Akan, feel the weight of what sin really is. It is against God. It's deceitful. It impacts others. It separates us from God. And it must be dealt with. And from that understanding of what sin is, can we realize the weight and the need for a saviour? We can bear all of that for you. And then we can now put our faith in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore the entire weight of the wrath of God for you, dying on a cross, rising from the dead to signify that your sin, your shame, all of that wrath is dealt with. Done. Now look with me at the final verse of this chapter again. You know, it will make complete sense to end with the words of God's anger was turned away. But it actually ends with the name of the place. Verse 26 ends like this. Therefore that place has been called the Valley of Accor ever since. Translated Accor, it means trouble. So it's been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. And indeed it's, it's a place of trouble. A place of trouble that's meant to recall God's judgment. But judgment is not the last word in this valley, for later on in the book of Hosea, we find these words. And I'll read it out to you in Hosea, chapter 2, verses 14 
it says this about the valley of Akor, or the valley of trouble. It says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. How is the valley of Accor, how is the valley of trouble transformed into a door of hope? It's through this place that Akan's sin was dealt with so that the Israelites could continue into the promised land. And you know, part of those people that continued into this promised land was Rahab. Through her family line, eventually came Jesus, who redeemed God's people from the penalty of their sin. You and I today are called to move from that valley of trouble, to embrace the gift of God's grace in Jesus the Saviour, who comes through that door of hope. What does this look like to do that? Well, let's, um, you can turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, or it will be up on the screen. And here, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, we are shown what a life of hope looks like. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Hear the good news there. God's message to us is not, uh, you're, is not this. It's not, uh, you're not holy, so you need to work on it until you get there. No. His message that, to us is, you are holy. Be what you already are in Jesus Christ. Be dead to your sin. This viewpoint, this way of living, fosters a confidence, a passion, and a true understanding of sin. Knowing that we are now holy, And forgiven just reminds us of the gravity of sin and what Jesus has done. Sin is so horrendous and powerful that the only way we could ever be pure was for God to intervene and do the work needed to declare us holy. Otherwise, we would be in the same boat as a car. For the Christian on this side of heaven, we will struggle with sin. But knowing that God sees us as holy in Jesus encourages us to live each day according to who we are, what we are. Akan died in the valley of trouble. You and I are called to move from that place and cling to the Lord Jesus, who is the door of hope. A passage that starts off very weighty. It's about judgment, about sin. When we see this with Christ in our lens, we see that there is hope and good news for us as Christ takes on our punishment. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, this morning you have warned us. You have shown us the seriousness of sin. We can't stand under your wrath and judgment on our own. Thank you that in your love and grace you sent Jesus to die for sinners like us. We thank you that the valley of Accor has been turned into the door of hope. Grant us a deep sense of our sins so we can have a deep and growing thankfulness and trust in our Saviour Jesus and to live for him each day. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now.